Chapter 5 of Triplanetary, first in the Lensman series by E. E. Doc Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Chenevere. Chapter 5, 1941. Chubby, brownette Eunice Kennison sat in a rocker, reading the Sunday papers and listening to her radio. Her husband, Ralph, lay sprawled upon the Davenport, smoking a cigarette and reading the current issue of Extraordinary Stories against the unheard background of music. Mentally, he was far from Tellus, flitting in his super-dreadnought through parsec after parsec of vacuous space. The music broke off without warning, and there blared out an announcement which yanked Ralph Kinnison back to earth with a violence almost physical. He jumped up, jammed his hands into his pockets, Pearl Harbor? he blurted. How in... how could they have let them get that far? But Frank, the woman gasped. She had not worried much about her husband, but Frank, her son. He'll have to go. Her voice died away. Not a chance in the world. Kinnison did not speak to soothe, but as though from sure knowledge. Designing engineer for Lockwood? He'll want to, all right, but everyone who was ever even exposed to a course in aeronautical engineering will sit this war out. But they say it can't last very long. It can't, can it? I'll say it can. Loose talk. Five years minimum is my guess. Not that my guess is any better than anybody else's. He prowled around the room. His somber expression did not lighten. I knew it, the woman said at last. You too, even after the last one, you haven't said anything, so I thought perhaps... I know I didn't. There was always the chance that we wouldn't get drawn into it. If you say so, though, I'll stay home. Am I apt to? I let you go when you were really in danger. What do you mean by that crack? he interrupted. Regulations, one year too old. Thank heaven. So what? They'll need technical experts bad. They'll make exceptions. Possibly. Desk jobs. Desk officers don't get killed in action, or even wounded. Why, perhaps, with children all grown up and married, we won't even have to be separated. Another angle, financial. Pfft, who cares about that? Besides, for a man out of a job. From you, I'll let that one pass. Thanks, Uni, you're an ace. I'll shoot him a wire. The telegram was sent. The Kinnisons waited and waited. Until about the middle of January, beautifully phrased and beautifully mimeographed letters began to arrive. The War Department recognizes the value of your previous military experience and appreciates your willingness once again to take up arms in defense of the country. Veteran Officer's Questionnaire. Please fill out completely. Form 191A. Form 170 in duplicate. Form 315. Impossible to forecast the extent to which the War Department may ultimately utilize the services which you and thousands of others have so generously offered. Form, form, not to be construed as meaning that you have been permanently rejected. Form, advise you that while at the present the War Department is unable to use you. Wouldn't that fry you to a crisp? Kennison demanded. What in hell have they got in their heads, sawdust? They think that because I'm fifty-one years old, I've got one foot in the grave. I'll bet four dollars that I'm in better shape than that cursed Major General and his whole damn staff. I don't doubt it, dear. Eunice's smile was, however, mostly of relief. But here's an ad. It's been running for a week. Chemical engineers? Shell-loading plant? Within seventy-five miles of Townville, over five years' experience. Organic chemistry, technology, explosives. They want you, Eunice declared soberly. Well, I'm a Ph.D. in organic. I've had more than five years' experience in both organic chemistry and technology. 
If I don't know something about explosives, I did a smart job of fooling Dean Montrose back at Goshwater University. I'll write him a letter. He wrote. He filled out a form. The telephone rang. Kennison speaking. Yes, Dr. Sumner? Oh, yes, Chief Chemist. Uh, that's it. One year over age, so I thought... Oh, that's a minor matter. We won't starve. If you can't pay a hundred and fifty, I'll come for a hundred or seventy-five or fifty. That's all right, too. I'm well enough known in my own field so that the title of junior chemical engineer won't hurt me a bit. Okay, I'll see you about one o'clock. Stoner and Black Incorporated. Operators. Entwhistle Ordnance Plant. Entwhistle Missacota. What? Well, maybe I could at that. Goodbye. He turned to his wife. You know what? They want me to come down right away and go to work. Hot dog. Am I glad that I told that louse Hendricks exactly where he could stick that job of mine? He must have known that you wouldn't sign a straight salary contract after getting a share of the profits so long. Maybe he believed what you always say just before or just after kicking somebody's teeth down their throats, that you're so meek and mild, a regular milk toast. Do you really think that they'll want you back after the war? It was clear that Eunice was somewhat concerned concerning Kinnison's joblessness, but Kinnison was not. Probably, that's the gossip. And I'll come back when hell freezes over. His square jaw tightened. I've heard of outfits stupid enough to let their technical brains go because they could sell, for a while, anything they produced. But I didn't know that I was working for one. Maybe I'm not exactly a timid soul, but you'll have to admit that I never kicked anybody's teeth out unless they tried to kick mine out first. Entwistle Ordnance Plant covered twenty-odd square miles of more or less level land. Ninety-nine percent of its area was inside the fence. Most of the buildings within that restricted area, while in reality enormous, were dwarfed by the vast spaces separating them, for safety distances are not small when TNT and tetral by the ton are involved. Those structures were built of concrete, steel, glass, transite, and tile. Outside the fence was different. This was the administration area. Its buildings were tremendous wooden barracks, relatively close together, packed with the executive, clerical, and professional personnel appropriate to an organization employing over 20,000 men and women. Well inside the fence, but a safety distance short of the one line, loading line number one, was a long, low building, quite inadequately named the Chemical Laboratory. Inadequately, in that the chief chemist, a highly capable, if more than a little cantankerous, explosives engineer, had already gathered into his chemical section most of development, most of engineering, and all of physics, weights and measures, and weather. One room of the chemical laboratory, in the corner most distant from administration, was separated from the rest of the building by a sixteen-inch wall of concrete and steel, extending from foundation to roof without a door, window, or other opening. This was the laboratory of the chemical engineers, the boys who played with explosives high and low. Any explosion occurring therein could not affect the chemical laboratory proper or its personnel. Entwistle's main roads were paved, but in February of 1942 such minor items as sidewalks existed only on the blueprints. Entwistle's soil contained much clay, and at that time the mud was approximately six inches deep. Hence, since there were neither inside doors nor sidewalks, it was only natural that the technologists did not visit at all frequently the polished tile cleanliness of the laboratory. It was also natural enough for the far larger group to refer to the segregated ones as exiles and outcasts, and that some witty chemist applied to that isolated place the name Siberia. The name stuck. More, the engineers seized it and acclaimed it. 
They were Siberians and proud of it. And Siberians they remained, long after Entwistle's mud turned into dust, and within the year the Siberians were to become well and favorably known in every ordnance plant in the country, to many high executives who had no idea of how the name originated. Kinnison became a Siberian as enthusiastically as the youngest man there. The term youngest is used in its exact sense, for not one of them was a recent graduate. Each had had at least five years of responsible experience, and Cappy Sumner kept on building. He hired extravagantly and fired ruthlessly, to the minds of some senselessly, but he knew what he was doing. He knew explosives, and he knew men. He was not liked, but he was respected. His building was good. Being one of the only two old men there, and the other did not stay long, Kinnison, as a junior chemical engineer, was not at first accepted without reserve. Apparently he did not notice that fact, but went quietly about his assigned duties. He was meticulously careful with, but very evidently not in any fear of, the materials with which he worked. He pelleted and tested tracer, igniter, and incendiary compositions. He took his turn at burning out rejects. Whenever asked, he went out on the lines with any one of them. His experimental tetrals always miked to size. His TNT melt pours, introductory to loading 40 millimeter on the three-line, came out solid, free from checks and cavitations. It became evident to those young but keen minds that he, alone of them all, was on familiar ground. They began to discuss their problems with him. Out of his years of technological experience, and by bringing everyone present into the discussion, he either helped them directly or helped them to help themselves. His stature grew. Black-haired, black-eyed Tug Tugwell, two hundred pounds of ex-football player in charge of Tracer on Seven Line, called him Uncle Ralph, and the habit spread. And in a couple of weeks, at about the same time that Engine Abernathy was slightly injured by being blown through a door by a minor explosion of his igniter on the Eighth Line, he was promoted to full chemical engineer, a promotion which went unnoticed since it involved only changes in title and salary. Three weeks later, however, he was made senior chemical engineer in charge of Melt Poor. At this there was a celebration led by Blondie Wanacek, a sulfuric acid expert handling tetral on the two. Kinnison searched minutely for signs of jealousy or antagonism, but could find none. He went blithely to work on the sixth line, where they wanted to start pouring twenty-pound fragmentation bombs, ably assisted by Tug and by two new men. One of these was Doc, or Bart Barton, who, the grapevine said, had been hired by Cappy to be his assistant. His motto, like that of Ricky Ticky Tavy, was to run and find out, and he did so with glee and abandon. He was a good egg. So was the other newcomer, Charlie Charlevoix, a prematurely gray paint and lacquer expert who had also made the Siberian grade. A few months later, Sumner called Kinnison into the office. The latter went, wondering what the old hard shell was going to cry about now, for to be called into that office meant only one thing, censure. Kinnison, I like your work, the chief chemist began gruffly, and Kinnison's mouth almost dropped open. Anybody who ever got a Ph.D. under Montrose would have to know explosives, and the FBI report on you showed that you had brains, ability, and guts. But none of that explains how you can get along so well with those damned Siberians. I want to make you assistant chief and put you in charge of Siberia. Formally, I mean, actually, you have been for months. Why, no, I didn't. Besides, how about Barton? He's too good a man to kick in the teeth that way. Admitted. This did surprise Kinnison. He had never thought that the irascible and tempestuous chief would ever confess to a mistake. 
This was a Cappy he had never known. I discussed it with him yesterday. He's a damned good man, but it's decidedly questionable whether he has got whatever it is that made Tugwell, Wanachek, and Charlevoix work straight through for seventy-two hours, napping now and then on benches and grabbing coffee and sandwiches when they could, until they got that frag bomb straightened out. Sumner did not mention the fact that Kennison had worked straight through, too. That was taken for granted. Well, I don't know. Kennison's head was spinning. I'd like to check with Barton first, okay? I expected that. Okay. Kennison found Barton and led him out behind the testing shed. Bart, Cappy tells me that he figures on kicking you in the face by making me assistant and that you'd okayed it. One word, and I'll tell the old buzzard just where to stick the job and exactly where to go to do it. Reaction perfect. Yield one hundred percent. Barton stuck out his hand. Otherwise, I would tell him all that myself, and more. As it is, Uncle Ralph, smooth out the ruffled plumage. They go to hell for you, waiting in, standing straight up. They might do the same with me in the driver's seat, and they might not. Why take a chance? You're it. Some things about the deal I don't like, of course, but at that it makes me about the only man working for Stoner and Black who can get a release any time a good permanent job breaks. I'll stick until then, okay? It was unnecessary for Barton to add that as long as he was there, he would really work. I'll say it's okay. And Kinnison reported to Sumner. All right, Chief, I'll try it, if you can square it with the Siberians. That will not be too difficult. Nor was it. The Siberians' reaction brought a lump to Kinnison's throat. Ralph the First, Tsar of Siberia, they yelled. Long live the Tsar, kowtow serfs and vessels, to Tsar Ralph the First. Kinnison was still glowing when he got home that night to the Government House Project, and to the three-room mansionette in which he and Eunice lived. He would never forget the events of that day. What a gang! What a gang! Uh, but listen, Ace, they work under their own power. You couldn't keep those kids from working. Why should I get the credit for what they do? I haven't the foggiest. Eunice wrinkled her forehead and her nose, but the corners of her mouth quirked up. Are you quite sure that you haven't had anything to do with it? But supper is ready. Let's eat. More months passed. Work went on. Absorbing work and highly varied. The details of which are of no importance here. Paul Jones, a big, hard, top-drawer chickle technologist, set up the four-line to pour demolition blocks. Frederick Hinton came in, qualified as a Siberian, and went to work on anti-personnel mines. Kinnison was promoted again to chief chemist. He and Sumner had never been friendly. He made no effort to find out why Cappy had quit or had been terminated, whichever it was. This promotion made no difference. Barton, now assistant, ran the whole chemical section, save for one unit, Siberia, and did a superlative job. The chief chemist's secretary worked for Barton, not for Kennison. Kennison was the czar of Siberia. The anti-personnel mines had been giving trouble. Too many men were being killed by prematures, and nobody could find out why. The problem was handed to Siberia. Hinton tackled it, missed, and called for help. The Siberians rallied round, Kinnison loaded and tested mines, so did Paul and Tug and Blondie. Kinnison was testing out in the firing area when he was called to administration to attend a staff meeting. Hinton relieved him. He had not reached the gate, however, when a guard car flagged him down. Sorry, sir, but there's been an accident at Pit Five, and you are needed out there. Accident? Fred Hinton, is he— I'm afraid so, sir. It is a harrowing thing to have to help gather up what fragments can be found of one of your best friends. Kennison was white and sick as he got back to the firing station, just in time to hear the chief safety officer say, 
Must have been carelessness, rank carelessness. I warned this man Hinton myself on one occasion. Carelessness, hell, Kinnison blazed. You had the guts to warn me once, too, and I've forgotten more about safety and explosives than you will ever know. Fred Hinton was not careless. If I hadn't been called in, that would have been me. What is it, then? I don't know, yet. I'll tell you now, though, Major Moulton, that I will know, and the minute I find out, I'll talk to you again. He went back to Siberia, where he found Tug and Paul, faces still tear-streaked, staring at something that looked like a small piece of wire. This is it, Uncle Ralph, Tug said brokenly. Don't see how it could be, but it is. What is it? Kinnison demanded. Firing pin, brittle. When you pull the safety, the force of the spring must break it off at this constricted section here. But, damn it, Tug, it doesn't make sense. It's tension. But wait, there'd be some horizontal component at that. But they'd have to be brittle as glass. I know it. It doesn't seem to make much sense. But we were there, you know, and I assembled every one of those goddamned mines myself. Nothing else could possibly have made that mine go off just when it did. Okay, Tug, we'll test him. Call in Bart. He can have the scale lab boys rig us up a gadget by the time we can get some more of those pins in off the line. They tested a hundred under the normal tension of the spring, and three of them broke. They tested another hundred. Five broke. They stared at each other. That's it, Kinnison declared, but this will stink to high heaven. Have inspection break out our new lot, and we'll test a thousand. Of that thousand pins, thirty-two broke. Bart, will you dictate a one-page preliminary report to Vera and rush it over to Building One as fast as you can? I'll go over and tell Moulton a few things. Major Moulton was, as usual, in conference, but Kinnison was in no mood to wait. Tell him, he instructed the Major's private secretary, who had barred his way, that either he will talk to me right now, or I will call the district safety over his head. I'll give him sixty seconds to decide which. Moulton decided to see him. I'm very busy, Dr. Kinnison, but I don't give a swivel-eyed tinker's damn how busy you are. I told you that the minute I found out what was the matter with the M2 mine, I'd talk to you again. Here I am. Brittle firing pins. Three and two-tenths percent effective. So I'm very irregular, doctor. The matter will have to go through channels. Not this one. The formal report is going through channels, but as I started to tell you, this is an emergency report to you as Chief of Safety. Since the defect is not covered by specs, neither process nor ordinance can reject except by test, and whoever does the testing will very probably be killed. Therefore, as every employee of Stoner and Black is not only authorized, but positively instructed to do upon discovering an unsafe condition, I am reporting it directly to safety. Since my whiskers are a trifle longer than an operator's, I am reporting it directly to the head of the safety division, and I am telling you that if you don't do something about it damned quick, stop production and slap a hold order on all the M2APs you can reach, I'll call district and make you personally responsible for every premature that occurs from now on. Since any safety man anywhere would much rather stop a process than authorize one, and since this particular safety man loved to throw his weight around, Kinnison was surprised that Moulton did not act instantly. The fact that he did not so act should have, but did not, give the naive Kinnison much information as to conditions existing outside the fence. But they need those mines very badly. They are an item of very heavy production. If we stop them, how long? Have you any suggestions? Yes. Call district and have them rush through a change of spec, including heat treat and a modified charpy test. In the meantime, we can get back into full production tomorrow, 
if you have district slap a hundred percent inspection upon those pens. Excellent. We can do that. Very fine work, Doctor. Miss Morgan, get district at once. This, too, should have warned Kinnison, but it did not. He went back to the laboratory. Tempus fugited. Orders came to get ready to load M67HE, AT, 105 mm high explosive armor tearing, shell on the nine, and the Siberians went joyously to work upon the new load. The explosive was to be a mixture of TNT and a polysyllabic compound, everything about which was highly confidential and restricted. But what the hell's so hush hush about that stuff? demanded Blondie who, with five or six others, was crowding around the Tsar's desk. Unlike the days of Cappy Sumner, the private office of the chief chemist was now as much Siberia as Siberia itself. The Germans developed it originally, didn't they? Yes, and the Italians used it against the Ethiopians, which was why their bombs were so effective. But it says hush-hush, so that's the way it will be. And if you talk in your sleep, Blondie, tell Betty not to listen. The Siberians worked. The M-67 was put into production. It was such a success that orders for it came in faster than they could be filled. Production was speeded up. Small cavitations began to appear, nothing serious, since they passed inspection. Nevertheless, Kennison protested in a formal report, receipt of which was formally acknowledged. General somebody or other, Entwistle's commanding officer, whom none of the Siberians had ever met, was transferred to more active duty, and a Colonel Snodgrass, or some such name, took his place. Ordnance got a new Chief Inspector. An M-67, it whistle-loaded, prematured in a gun barrel, killing twenty-seven men. Kennison protested again, verbally this time at a staff meeting. He was assured, verbally, that a formal and thorough investigation was being made. Later he was informed, verbally and without witnesses, that the investigation had been completed and that the loading was not at fault. A new commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Franklin, appeared. The Siberians, too busy to do more than glance at newspapers, paid very little attention to a glider crash in which several notables were killed. They heard that an investigation was being made, but even the Tsar did not know until later that Washington had, for once, acted fast in correcting a bad situation. That inspection, which had been under production, was summarily divorced therefrom. And gossip spread abroad that Stillman, then head of the inspection division, was not a big enough man for the job. Thus it was an entirely unsuspecting Kennison who was called into the innermost private office of Thomas Keller, the superintendent of production. Kennison, how in hell do you handle those Siberians? I never saw anything like them before in my life. No, and you never will again. Nothing on earth except a war could get them together or hold them together. I don't handle them. They can't be handled. I give them a job to do and let them do it. I back them up. That's all. <laughs> Keller grunted. That's a hell of a formula. If I want anything done right, I've got to do it myself. But whatever your system is, it works. But what I wanted to talk to you about is, how'd you like to be head of the inspection division, which would be enlarged to include your present chemical section? Huh? Kinnison demanded, dumbfounded. At a salary well up on the confidential scale. Keller wrote a figure upon a piece of paper, showed it to his visitor, then burned it in an ashtray. Kinnison whistled. I like it, for more reasons than that. But I didn't know that you, or have you already checked with the General and Mr. Black? Naturally, came the smooth reply. In fact, I suggested it to them and have their approval. Perhaps you are curious to know why? I certainly am. For two reasons. First, because you have developed a crew of technical experts that is the envy of every technical man in the country. Second, you and your Siberians have done every job I ever asked you to, and done it fast. 
As a division head, you will no longer be under me. But I am right, I think, in assuming that you will work with me just as effectively as you do now. I can't think of any reason why I wouldn't. This reply was made in all honesty. But later, when he came to understand what Keller had meant, how bitterly Kinnison was to regret its making. He moved into Stillman's office and found there what he thought was ample reason for his predecessor's failure to make good. To his way of thinking it was tremendously overstaffed, particularly with assistant chief inspectors. Delegation of authority, so widely preached throughout Entwistle's ordinance plant, had not been given even lip service here. Stillman had not made a habit of visiting the lines, nor did the chief line inspectors. The boys who really knew what was going on ever visit him. They reported to the assistants who reported to Stillman, who handed down his Jovian pronouncements. Kinnison set out, deliberately this time, to mold his key chief line inspectors into just such a group as the Siberians already were. He released the assistants to more productive work, retaining of Stillman's office staff only a few clerks and his private secretary, one Celeste de St. Aubin, a dynamic, vivacious, at times explosive, brunette. He gave the boys on the lines full authority. The few who could not handle the load he replaced with men who could. At first the chief line inspectors simply could not believe. But after the affair of the forty millimeter, in which Tennyson rammed the decision of his subordinate past Keller, past the general, past Stoner and Black, and clear up to the commanding officer before he made it stick, they were his to a man. Others of his section heads, however, remained aloof. Petler, whose technical section was now part of inspection, and Wilson of Gages were two of those who talked largely and glowingly, but acted obstructively if they acted at all. As weeks went on, Kinnison became wiser and wiser, but made no sign. One day, during a lull, his secretary hung out the in-conference sign and went into Kinnison's private office. There isn't a reference to any such investigation anywhere in central files. She paused, as if to add something, then turned to leave. As you were, Celeste, sit down. I expected that. Suppressed, if made at all. You're a smart girl, Celeste, and you know the ropes. You know that you can talk to me, don't you? Yes, but this is... well, the word is going around that they are going to break you, just as they have broken every other good man on the reservation. I expected that, too. The words were quiet enough, but the man's jaw tightened. Also, I know how they are going to do it. How? This speed up on the nine. They know that I won't stand still for the kind of casts that Keller's new procedure, which goes into effect tonight, is going to produce, and this new CO probably will. Silence fell, broken by the secretary. General Sanford, our first CO, was a soldier, and a good one, she declared finally. So was Colonel Snodgrass. Lieutenant Colonel Franklin wasn't, but he was too much of a man to do the dirt. Dirty work. Dryly. Exactly. Go on. And Stoner, the New York half, ninety-five percent, really, of Stoner and Black Incorporated, is a big-time operator. So we get this damned nincompoop of a major, who doesn't know a F-U-S-E from F-U-Z-E, directly from a Wall Street desk. So what? One must have heard Ralph Kinnison say those two words, to realize how much meaning they can be made to carry. So what? the girl blazed, wringing her hands. Ever since you have been over here I have been expecting you to blow up, to smash something, in spite of the dozens of times you have told me a fighter cannot slug effectively Celeste until he gets both feet firmly planted. When, when are you going to get your feet planted? Never, I'm afraid, he said glumly as she stared. So I'll have to start slugging with at least one foot in the air. That startled her. Explain, please. I wanted proof. 
stuff that I could take to the district, uh, that I could use to tack some hides out flat on a barn door with. Do I get it? I do not. Not a shred. Neither can you. What chance do you think there is of ever getting any real proof? Very little, Celeste admitted. But you can at least smash Petler, Wilson, and that crowd. How I hate those slimy snakes. I wish that you could smash Tom Keller, the poisonous moron. Not so much moron, although he acts like one at times. As an ignorant puppet with a head swelled three sizes too big for his hat, but you can quit yapping about slugging. Fireworks are due to start at two o'clock tomorrow afternoon, when Drake is going to reject tonight's run of shell. Really? But I don't see how either Petler or Wilson come in. They don't. A fight with those small fry, even smashing them, wouldn't make enough noise. Keller. Keller, Celeste squealed. But you'll— I know. I'll get fired. So what? By tackling him, I can raise enough hell so that the big shots will have to cut out at least some of the rough stuff. You'll probably get fired, too, you know. You've been too close to me for your own good. Not me, she shook her head vigorously. The minute they terminate you, I quit. Poof, who cares? Besides, I can get a better job in Townville. Without leaving the project, that's what I figured. It's the boys I'm worried about. I've been getting them ready for this for weeks. But they will quit, too. You're Siberians, you're inspectors. Of a surety, they will quit every one. They won't release them. And what Stoner and Black will do to them, even after the war, if they quit without releases, shouldn't be done to a dog. They won't quit, either. At least if they don't try to push them around too much. Keller's mouth is watering to get hold of Siberia, but he'll never make it, nor any one of his stooges. I'd better dictate a memorandum to Black on that now, while I'm calm and collected, telling him what he'll have to do to keep my boys from tearing Entwistle apart. But do you think he will pay any attention to it? I'll say he will, Kinnison snorted. Don't kid yourself about Black, Celeste. He's a smart man. Before this is done, he'll know that he'll have to keep his nose clean. But you, how can you do it? Celeste marveled. Me, I would urge them on. Few would have the patriotism. Patriotism? Hell! If that were all, I would have stirred up a revolution long ago. It's for the boys, in years to come. They've got to keep their noses clean, too. Get your notebook, please, and take this down. Rough draft. I'm going to polish it up until it has teeth and claws in every line. And that evening, after supper, he informed Eunice of all the new developments. Is it still okay with you, he concluded, for me to get myself fired off this high-salaried job of mine? Certainly. Being you, how could you do anything else? Oh, how I wish I could wring their necks. That conversation went on and on, but additional details are not necessary here. Shortly after two o'clock of the following afternoon, Celeste took a call and listened shamelessly. Kennison speaking. Tug, Uncle Ralph. The cast sectioned just like we thought they would. Dead ringers for plate D. So Drake hung a red ticket on every train. Pity was right there, waiting and started to raise hell. So I chipped in, and he beat it so fast that I looked to see his coat tail catch fire. Drake didn't quite like to call you, so I did. If Pity keeps on going at the rate he left here, He'll be in Keller's office in nothing flat. Okay, Tug, tell Drake that the shells he rejected are going to stay rejected. And to come in right now with his report, would you like to come along? Would I? Tugwell hung up. And, but do you want him here, Doc? Celeste asked anxiously, without considering whether or not her boss would approve of her eavesdropping. I certainly do. If I can keep Tug from blowing his top... The rest of the boys will stay in line. A few minutes later, Tugwell strode in, bringing with him Drake, the chief line inspector of the Nine Line. Shortly thereafter, the office door was wrenched open. 
Keller had come to Kennison, accompanied by the superintendent whom the Siberians referred to somewhat contemptuously as Pity. "'Damn your soul, Kennison! Come out here! I want to talk to you!' Keller roared, and doors snapped open up and down the long corridor. "'Shut up, you goddamn louse!' This from Tugwell, who, black eyes almost emitting sparks, was striding purposefully forward. I'll sock you so damn hard that pipe down, Tug, I'll handle this. Kinnison's voice was not loud, but it had then a peculiarly carrying and immensely authoritative quality. Verbally or physically, however he wants to have it. He turned to Keller who had jumped backward into the hall to avoid the young Siberian. As for you, Keller, if you had the brains that God gave bastard geese in Ireland, you would have had this conference in private. Since you started it in public, however, I'll finish it in public. How you came to pick me for a yes-man, I'll never know. Just one more measure of your stupidity, I suppose. Those shells are perfect, Keller shouted. Tell Drake here to pass them right now. If you don't, by God, I'll— Shut up. Kinnison's voice cut. I'll do the talking. You listen. The spec says, quote, Shall be free from objectionable cavitation, unquote. The line inspectors who know their stuff say that those cavitations are objectionable. So do the chemical engineers. Therefore, as far as I am concerned, they are objectionable. Those shells are rejected, and they will stay rejected. That's what you think, Keller raged. But there'll be a new head of inspection who will pass them tomorrow morning. In that you may be half right. When you get through licking Black's boots, tell him I'm in my office. Kinnison re-entered his suite. Keller, swearing, strode away with pity. Doors clicked. I am going to quit, Uncle Ralph, law or no law, Tugwell stormed. They'll run that bunch of crap through, and then— Will you promise not to quit until they do? Kinnison asked quietly. Huh? What? Tugwell's eyes and Celeste's were pools of astonishment. Celeste, being on the inside, understood first. Oh, to keep his nose clean, I see, she exclaimed. Exactly. Those shells will not be accepted, nor any like them. On the surface, we got licked. I will get fired. You will find, however, that we won this particular battle. And if you boys stay here and hang together and keep on slugging, you can win a lot more. Maybe if we raise enough hell, we can make them fire us, too, Drake suggested. I doubt it. But unless I'm wrong, you can just about write your own ticket from now on, if you play it straight. Kinnison grinned to himself at something which the young men could not see. You told me what Stoner and Black would do to us, Tugwell said intensely. What I'm afraid of is that they'll do it to you. They can't. Not a chance in the world, Kinnison assured him. You fellows are young, not established. But I'm well known enough in my own field, so that if they tried to blackball me, they just get themselves laughed at, and they know it. So beat it back to the nine, you kids, and hang red tickets on everything that doesn't cross-section up to standard. Tell the gang goodbye for me. I'll keep you posted. In less than an hour, Kinnison was called into the office of the president. He was completely at ease. Black was not. It has been decided to, uh, <clears throat> ask for your resignation, the president announced at last. Save your breath, Kennison advised. I came down here to do a job, and the only way you can keep me from doing that job is to fire me. That was not uh, entirely unexpected. A difficulty arose, however, in deciding what reason to put on your termination papers. I can well believe that. You can put down anything you like, Kinnison shrugged, with one exception. Any implication of incompetence, and you'll have to prove it in court. Incompatibility, say? Okay. Miss Briggs, uh, incompatibility with the highest echelon of Stoner and Black Incorporated, please. Uh, you may as well wait, Dr. Kinnison. It will only take a moment. Fine. 
I've got a couple of things to say. First, I know as well as you do that you're between Scylla and Charybdis. Damned if you do and damned if you don't. Certainly not. Ridiculous, Black blustered. But his eyes wavered. Where did you get such a preposterous idea? What do you mean? If you ram those substandard H-E-A-T shells through, you are going to have some more prematures. Not many. The stuff is actually almost good enough. One in ten thousand, say. Perhaps one in fifty thousand. But you know damned well that you can't afford any. What my Siberians and inspectors know about you and Keller and Pity and the Nine Line would be enough. But to cap the climax, that brainless jackal of yours let the cat completely out of the bag this afternoon, and everyone in Building One was listening. One more premature would blow Entwistle wide open, would start something that not all the politicians in Washington could stop. On the other hand, if you scrap those lots and go back to pouring good loads, your Mr. Stoner of New York and Washington will be very unhappy and will scream bloody murder. I'm sure, however, that you won't offer any plate D loads to ordinance in view of the temper of my boys and girls and the number of people who heard your dumb stooge give you away. You don't dare to. In fact, I told some of my people that you wouldn't, that you were a smart enough operator to keep your nose clean. You told them? Black shouted in anger and dismay. Yes, why not? The words were innocent enough, but Kinnison's expression was full of meaning. I don't want to seem trite, but you are just beginning to find out that honesty and loyalty are a hell of a hard team to beat. Get out! Take these termination papers and get out. And Dr. Ralph K. Kinnison, head high, strode out of President Black's office and out of Entwistle Ordnance Plant. End of Chapter 5